Sean Simpson, founder and chief scientific officer of Lancer Tech. Just his title alone makes the Bunsen burner and me burn a little bit brighter. Um, Dr. Sean Simpson is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Lancer Tech and leads the development and commercialization of Lancer Tech's core technology. Since its inception in 2005, Sean has led the company to secure numerous rounds of venture capital funding, significant commercial and technical partnerships with leading global organizations and government R&D grants. Dr. Simpson, I feel like I should be showing you my vitals. His leadership has encouraged collaboration between biologists, fermentation specialists, process and design engineers and business development teams to develop the technology and the company to become a global leader in gas fermentation. Now, I mean, we can make lots and lots of jokes about what you do with bad gas. But, in a nutshell, we're going to keep this one tight and concise this evening. Elevate a pitch. What do you do with bad gas? We turn um, shit into gold. We turn, <laughs> we, we turn uh, waste gases that are emitted as an inevitable consequence of industry mm. into fuels and chemicals, bottom line. And your fuels and chemicals that, are, that come out the other end of that process are so good that they've been given big old fat ticks from various organisations? Yeah, I mean, fuels that you blend with gasoline, chemicals that are direct replacements for petrochemicals. Well, so they're the same chemical. What, what, what was happening to these bad gases, these waste products, if you didn't get hold of them? Well, they're either flared, so you've got then gas going straight into the atmosphere, uh, global warming, and or, or they can be burned and turned to electricity. The challenge with the latter is electricity is very low value mm. and ends in a terminal carbon output. So, so you end up with CO2, whatever you do. You flare it, you turn on electricity, either way you end up with a lot of CO2. What we do is take that same gas lock the carbon into a fuel, use that fuel to displace oil. This obviously makes a lot of people like myself quite excited. However, I would imagine that there are a number of different people who um, have oil as their primary source of income a little bit pissed off. No, not really. You know, it's, that's always a fallacy that, that, that I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's in part fallacy that, that the oil industry wants to protect um, its resource and protect the use of oil. We've got investment from oil companies uh, because they recognise that they want to be part of a next wave, whatever that next wave looks like. Um, we're not in, we're not we're not going to threaten the oil industry in the next 20 years. No way. Yeah, I mean, the oil industry today we consume. 85 million barrels of oil a day. That yeah? is, it's, so, it just so blows your mind, doesn't it? You'd have to scale from here to, to hero uh, in, in a way that's beyond anything the world's ever seen. So it's not going to happen. Mm. But we do represent a very new paradigm in the production of, of fuels and chemicals. Explain to me how you, you ended up doing this. I mean, it, it seems... The stuff of I mean, the future is now essentially. Mm. When did this idea uh, arrive? Was it something that you you know you had a eureka moment, or was it a, a collaboration of, of like-minded, awesome people? Yeah, I mean, it was. It's kind of one of those things that sort of evolved a little bit out of circumstance, out of knowledge, um, uh, and out of luck. You know, we there's two of us that started the company, myself and, and my co-founder, Richard. And we were working in a company here in New Zealand, uh, a company where it was one of those situations where you're working in a company, it's a great way to learn how not to do business. You know, sort of this thing's falling apart around your ears, but it's not your company. So you kind of sit back on, and watch the car crash and, and think, well, if I was driving this car, how would I not crash the car? <laughs> so that was, that was part of it. The other part of it was we were working already in the biofuel space, but we were thinking about using wood as a resource for making fuel. That was, that was kind of our project. And through that project, we started to understand something of the economics of making renewable fuels, low carbon fuels. Uh, and, and so we're in this kind of car crash and we understand the biofuel business, yeah? And, and our eureka, I suppose, was not to say this, this industry needs a new technology, it was rather to say this industry needs to think about, f about the resources that are used to make low carbon fuels in a very different way. Because using wood 
is great, but wood turns out to be kind of expensive. Um, and so if you use a different resource that's not expensive, that would be better. Uh, what would be even better if that resource was available today and what would be even better still if that resource didn't need any transport. Mm. And so if you're thinking about all those things, what are you thinking about? You really end up thinking about wastes like landfill or waste like the stuff that comes out of industrial processes. So it's available in large volumes, it's pretty low cost, um, and it's available in a single location. And so therefore, if you, if you look at those two things, what technology unifies those as a way to convert that into a fuel? Mm. And it's gas fermentation because the waste in a landfill can be turned into a gas, the waste coming out of industry exists as a gas. And so then as biologists started applying ourselves to what biology, because we only knew biology, what biology would allow that to happen? So what's confusing me thus far is you've got the scientific brain. What, how, what kind of relationships have you, what did you do to get the money to make this happen? Who have you slept with? Well, my wife mostly, oh. um, <laughs> who's here, and, uh, uh, and that was, that's been enormously enjoyable. Um, <laughs> but, well done. <laughs> 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 I've but, got some tips. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, look, at, at first we started a company with nothing. We, we, both, we both got a bit of a, a, a sort of uh, a, 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 a goodbye uh, amount of cash from, our, from the company that was crashing. And uh, that wasn't very much. It was literally you know, sort of small, small thousands of dollars. And uh, so we started up really going to people raising money from day one. We had no money and we were proposing a technology that was going to end up looking like an oil refinery, yeah? That's so, very attractive. <laughs> yeah, I so, mean, that's, that's, that's what putting lipstick on the gassy pig really yeah, is. Well, it? but it's, yeah, but it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's very unusual because you're going to people saying, we've got no money, but, but this, <laughs> this, this is going to be the next big thing. You know, <laughs> this is, we're, we're going to be the next Exxon. And, um, and so, we, uh, we at first approached loads and loads of people. We approached venture capital, we approached angels, we approached um, government, and everybody just laughed in our face. Wow. And, that, and you've, got to get, you've got to get used to that. How long was that process? What, how long was that while well, people were laughing at you? How uh, much of a laugh did you that, get? That was, that, was <laughs> about, that was about six months of laughing, uh, which, which, of course, you know, it, I, think, I think we lifted a lot of people's morale. Um, <laughs> Uh, but eventually what we ended up doing is going to a small science company here uh, called Biodiscovery and we went to them and we said, look, we actually, we need a lab, we need to get started, how do we get started uh, in your lab, what do you want? And uh, they wanted to actually invest in us, which was great, we hadn't heard that before. And, um, and so they gave us a small amount of, literally a tiny amount of money just to get going, just to prove the concept, because at that point all we had was a piece of paper in which we had a bunch of chemical equations written out and say, look, it's definitely going to work. That's a really compelling business model, <laughs> eh? <laughs> but, so but we you should have up with the Bunsen burners and all of the crazy stuff that you find in high school um, laboratories. Now, see... But that's I'm, a P-lab, so... That, oh. <laughs> Which That's what would have been a good way to fund the business. <laughs> so so this, is the thing, this is the question that gets asked most at Startup Grinds. This is what people really want to hear. How do we take this initial idea that we have so much faith in, we really do believe in, but we're finding it... Did you ever lose faith in those six months that maybe we should give this up as, as a, a, a dead horse? You know, it, it's, is it worth flogging? Was there, was there any moment where you just really thought she just felt, I can't sleep with my beautiful wife anymore, I'm that depressed, this is taking a toll? That never happened. But um, <laughs> there, was, there was... You know, it was tough. It was... It was of course it was tough, but... but what we gave ourselves effectively was a time frame. We, we started the company, I think, in March, and we said, right, our aim is to get paid by Christmas. That's our aim. And so if we don't get paid by Christmas, then we give it up. We had a bit of money. Uh, my wife, thankfully, was working it. And, and so you know, the bills were getting paid just. And uh, so you just kind of eke it along, yeah? Mm, mm. And... Um, and that's, 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 that's okay. And, and, as, uh, and, and for me, it wasn't about losing faith. You couldn't lose faith if you gave yourself a timeline. Because right. you said, right, for this time period, I'm, I'm going to stick to this no matter what. Mm. And, and then all the times people said no, it was really understanding why they said no. And going through that discipline of understanding all the questions they asked, having answers to all of them, 
and then keep going back and pitching. So and really knowing, A, what you're talking about, knowing, knowing your shit, really. Yeah. So that whenever somebody has a challenging question, you can just boom. This yeah. Is it. Yeah. And but also pitch in a way that you avoid the challenging question, or you you open the question you want asked. And that's and that's and that's you don't you don't go in knowing that you learn that. Learn yeah. it along the way. And so let's talk about what you have learned. Um, again, elevator pitch, Sean, mm. from the early years. Take us from the moment not necessarily of conception, but. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? What has shaped you into the man that you are today? Okay, so born in Africa, lived throughout the world. See, I always expect somebody to say Tipuki, but it's never <laughs> just Tipuki, is it? <laughs> yeah, uh, lived throughout the world, um, educated in the UK, um, then moved to Japan, met uh, my wife in Japan, much against the plan. Um, uh, moved to New Zealand in 2002, um, worked for a while in a, in a company, started Landstech in 05 and uh, raised our first serious amount of money in 07. Pretty concise, tight timeline. <laughs> Far out. Were you always interested in science as a kid? Uh, yeah, but I, as a kid I really wanted to be a psychologist, which looking back was, uh, was just, you know, it just showed how stupid I was. <laughs> but then on saying that you have got an incredible track record with um, developing building and maintaining relationships with people who give you exorbitant amounts of money so there's got a bit of be a bit of psychology at work there yeah there's a amount of psychology I mean there's a there's a there's a there's an amount of good fortune uh, there uh, there's a lot of good fortune there you know uh, and uh, and then there's a lot of meeting people that, that can make those introductions for you. I mean, meeting people like Vinod, who invested in us in 07 in our Series A, did not come because we were all charming people that, that made great relationships with Vinod. We were we made we got that introduction because we knew someone else who knew him and, and, mm. and connected the dots for us. Um, and I think it's 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 about looking at every every step in your company as, as to how it's going to lead to the next step and what opportunities that opens up for you. So how do you find those, those next steps? Where, where on earth have you been networking to meet the right people? Well, okay, so first of all, you, you, sort, of, so you sort of dial it back and say, okay, this is the opportunity and at the moment I'm stuck here. So at that time, so 05, 06, when we started, we are raising 200,000, 300,000 lumps of of money, which seemed great at the time, but you do that three times, and it's, it starts to feel like the death of a thousand cuts because you know you're you're losing equity for tiny amounts of money that buy you the ability to raise a bit more money, and that's and that's all it does, uh, and uh, and so then you want to approach people who can raise who through who you can raise a lot more money, and. Um, and then you so you're thinking, how are you going to do that? You know, how are you going to, how am I going to get introduced to someone who's going to who's going to invest three and a half million, four million, twelve million mm. in the company? Mm. And what I wish I knew then, which I which which I didn't, was how differently you would think about your process uh, once you had that cash, because at that time you're thinking, okay, I'm I'm going to make a three year plan, or I'm going to make a two year plan, and we're going to get to there because I'm used to thinking about 200, 200 300,000 dollars. But I know that I need a massive amount of money. So we, we connected with people like Stephen and like the late, great Ross Clark, a, 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 an angel investor who invested in us, who, who had great networks. So we didn't just raise money, we raised money, smart money, really smart money. Stephen's got probably the greatest network in New Zealand, uh, uh, Stephen Tyndall. And Ross Clark had probably one of the greatest networks in Silicon Valley of any Kiwi. And so through those guys, we had great connection here and great connection in the land of change, you know. Mm. And, um, and that gave us the ability to ask for a large amount of money, which in turn gave us the ability to think about how much money, what we could do if we had a lot of cash. Yeah. Yeah, this is something else that I've heard so many, so many times during these talks. What could we do if we had? It's hard. It's, it's, it's hard. You know what you could do. How are you going to find it? And this is um, another question that I, I was 
really keen to ask you, and you, you've put it so beautifully, it's not really about finding the people to give you the five million dollars, it's finding the people who can give you the five million dollars and back it up with brilliant support, brilliant yeah. advice, brilliant networking, and th th they give more than just the dollar. Yeah, so you need smart money. You need, like, dollars alone are, are only half of the prize. So think about raising money into, so venture capitalists will tend to think about investing in a company, not, not in terms of the investment they're about to make, but in terms of the investment they will be making. Right. Because, because very few companies will deliver immediately on, on, what, on, on, on everything that's presented in their investment plan. Yeah, things change, the world changes, and, 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 and t growing technologies need to adapt, number one. Number two is, you don't just need money, you need the advice of people who have seen companies grow from zero to hero and know how to avoid missteps and to, to make the right decision. And, uh, and, 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 and people who've invested in you and who've seen that are very, very willing to give you <laughs> very clear advice on what you should be doing. And, and so, those, so people with a strong track record of, of successful investment are, are critical. People with a strong track record of raising sufficient money or possessing sufficient money to fund you going forward, not just today, are completely essential. Um, that is pretty much, we've had a couple of people talk and not answer that question as well as you have. They've often said, hey, look, money's money. It's what you do with it. But um, basically, I would have said that if I'd gotten $5 million <laughs> mm. from somebody. Um, it's a pretty unique concept, but it's not... It's a unique concept that has actually been put into action, but it's not a, a unique, unique concept. Has there been any competitors that you've had to um, sort of fight alongside? Or is it just such a young, burgeoning industry that you're finding more people being inspired by what you've done? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've really led this industry uh, in many ways, yeah? So we've shown that uh, this is an industry that, uh, that is scalable, that's really important because we're producing fuel and you've got to produce fuel uh, at rates that look sensible to, uh, to, to, the, to the fuel industry, yeah? Uh, so you're not making Fabergé eggs, so you can't produce one a day. You're making fuels, you've got to produce millions of, of, of gallons. And um, so, so that's critical. And we've shown that this technology is something that can scale to, to that end. Um, we've also shown that this is a technology that can not just make fuel, which is what our uh, biological process does naturally, it can also make a variety of chemicals uh, and we develop the technology to allow that to happen. And, uh, and that's required, one, a great deal of research, two, a very clear and, uh, I suppose, dedicated patent strategy. And, and the IP strategy that we've adopted is quite aggressive, but I think necessary given the market we're in and given the opportunity that, that is presented uh, by our process. How big's the company now? In terms of people, about 100 people. Far out. Where are you based at the moment? Uh, Parnell and Chicago, Shanghai, Small Business Development Office in Delhi. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> and of course, we all know that you're just about to jump ship. I don't see it as jumping ship. How do you see it? I, I think it's doing the right thing for the company. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. I mean, our company is growing up. It's it's um, it's time to consolidate. Our, our big our big push now is to commercialise our technology, and it's very difficult to do that when you've got research based here, engineering based somewhere else, mm. commercialisation happening in a third place. So you've got to bring everything together. And um, are you taking? In the hundred of people from here over to we're taking we're taking our, our I guess our core um, technical capability with us yeah wow how are you gonna, how do you feel about 
I mean, you've been all over the world already, so this isn't going to be that much of a sort of new experience for you. Have you had any of your staff based here in New Zealand um, have an issue with moving overseas, or are they that invested, that excited about what they're up to? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, there's the, the, the vast majority of people we've asked to, to join us uh, have, uh, have agreed. And people don't make that decision lightly. Mm. People, you know, people um, really, really have to, that's something they really have to think about. You're not asking them to change the, the place they sit in the office now. You're asking them has, to, has to relocate it, has their it been life. Has um, a challenge for you, if you've lost any of those core people to, to find, them, find them again? Dealing with workforce as human resources is, is probably yeah. one of the most difficult. When you get to that sort of size, it, that's a challenge. Yes, it is a challenge. Um, We've lost, we lost some people that we, we didn't want to lose, but yeah. like I said, the vast majority of people we kept. And, 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 and at the end of the day, you can't grow a business with the view that these three people are, you know, if we lose these three people... Then it's all going to come crashing down. Oh, it's over. Yeah. And it, it, if, if that were the case, then we'd have completely mismanaged how we grew the business. Mm. And that would be a very poor reflection on, 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 on the company. Are you on target for where you want to be? Did you think back in 2005 that by 2014, this is where Lancer Tech is going to be? No. no, no idea. I had no idea what Lancer Tech would become. I had no idea what the possibilities were, and I had no idea what it would take to, to get to where we've got to. Exceeded expectations? Just had no idea. No, really no. I, di I didn't know that the door to this land was even, even there. Wow. And, and, that's, and that goes back to what we said before, uh, we were talking before about, about the amount of money, yeah? If you're going along raising $300,000 and you're thinking this scale, yeah? When and, are you ever going to get to that scale? And, and, well, it's not about that scale, it's about something that fills this room. Wow. You can't even imagine how, you know, you, you, you've got to try, you're trying to imagine what if I raise now $600,000, not 60 million. <laughs> And so, so you, you, your 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 ambition are completely are, are completely your ambitions are completely limited by by the financial horizons that, that are imposed upon you. Is is Richard was Richard as enthusiastic as you with that that wonderful sense of just trust in the belief of what you've actually got in your back pocket of an idea? R Richard was, yeah. I mean, Richard's. Richard, Richard was like a science anarchist. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was one of the most innovative thinkers I've ever met. And he sadly passed away this year. I, 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 yeah. Hmm. yeah. How did that affect you? Uh, it, it's like losing a brother, a, a, a partner. You know, it's, it's, it's like losing some part of the business, almost. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, Richard was, Richard became sick in um, sort of 09, uh, uh, 10, and stepped out of the business at that time. Right. So he, he, had, he had made a, I mean, he had to focus on his health. That made a lot of sense. And he stepped out of the business then. And so, so as, as Lanzatech, he had not been part of the, the growth of the company uh, for some time. Mm. I mean, for me personally, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, we um, we're too, far too often hear of, um, of this happening. Now, we've talked about the move away from New Zealand. Have there been criticism? Has there been criticism from, from people who feel that you, could, you should keep the business here in New Zealand? Actually, no, not really. I mean, we've, we're, we're moving our, uh, some core research facilities away. We're keeping our pilot plant here. We're still going to have uh, around 20 folk based in, in New Zealand. So I don't see, I don't see us as, as abandoning the, uh, New Zealand. That's, that's definitely not the case. Absolutely not the case. Um, it's the right thing for us to do. And we're, you know, no one grows a business in the context of a country, that doesn't, unless, unless you're your business is making flags but you know you, you, you grow you grow you grow a business to to make that business successful yeah yeah and you make decisions to make that business successful and our business is uh has a greater chance of success if we consolidate elsewhere 
I mean, what is the what's the next level of success for you? Because you had no bloody idea what was going to happen in the beginning. Two thousand and five no. was just a woo. Let's go into <laughs> this. Mm. Literally blindfolded, but very enthusiastic with an incredible idea. You, you, like I said, you took the future and you made it happen. What's next for Landsec? Aside from moving overseas, the majority of it, and it's lovely to know that you're keeping bits and pieces here. What's next? I'm um, excited. So. Lanzatech today is not a success. Lanzatech will be a success when its process is commercialized. We have been successful in doing the things we wanted to do to date. Mm -hmm. But right now what we're about is turning a technology that today produces hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel a year into a technology that produces hundreds of millions of gallons of fuel a year or chemicals a year. And that, and going from, and making that scale leap is uh, is what we're about right now. And that's that's um, when that happens, and we do that successfully, Landsatec would have been a success. <coughs> right now, we uh, that's what we're about. How do you manage all of those people all over the world? How do you keep? Oh, I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do with me, says Sean. I've got people to do that, but um. Well, I mean, for example, here at Generate, we've got two sites, and this is a much, much smaller scale, but we've got two sites, and we, we often find it hard to translate um, our culture to our satellite site. Mm. Have you had um, any input into how to keep together these various different hubs of activity worldwide and really install in those people the values of Landstech, the culture? Yeah, I mean, I mean... <sighs> Communications, communication is something you never get right. Yes, communication is something you always work on. You always have to improve, no matter what you do. Um, and so, yeah, it's that's that's a an ongoing continuum of challenge, I would say. And you've got you only just, a scientist would say continuum. <laughs> but it's 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 something you've got to continue. You know, you, you can't ever stop working on it. You mm. can't ever assume that everybody understands everything. You've mm. got to constantly reinforce, constantly educate, constantly talk to people and, and, and bring them back to core values, strategy, uh, and, uh, and, and focus, yeah? What are the values and, uh, of, of Landstech? Do you have your three words of... of... Uh, I mean, what we, what we want to do is develop a, a technology that allows fuels and chemicals to be produced at low cost and, and we believe in things like energy democracy. We believe in, in, uh, in ensuring that industrial processes have a minimal or zero or beneficial impact eventually on, on the environment. Are you changing the world? If we commercialise our technology, there's a good chance we will be. God. I, I really am very, very excited about that. It, it, it's, it's actually quite a privilege. God, I sound like such a brown noser at the moment. It's a, it's a privilege to speak to somebody who has <laughs> such a vision. God damn it! Okay, stop it. Um, questions. Do we have any questions thus far from the audience? Take into consideration that once we do finish speaking, Miss Simpson will be bolting out the door to yet another engagement. He's very popular. Mm. Very popular. Ladies, gentlemen, I'll stop picking on people. When you first started out, like getting into the sort of technical day, how did you um, know exactly what your um, sort of initial resources were and how did you identify like, the target market? What was that? Sorry, uh, my initial? Target market and the early results. How did you. Uh, yeah, but I mean, look, so this is, this is the. This is the this is the stupidity in, in a sense of what we're doing, yeah? There is no market risk. I don't have to have a customer for fuel because none of us arrived uh, in a place in the last week without burning fuel. So, so the market risk doesn't exist. I don't have to say the person who's going to buy this is this person and they look like this and they're thinking this way. Yeah, so the market risk doesn't exist. What is real is a technical risk. And so from a, as a scientist starting a business, it's, it's ideal because you're saying, well, the risk is the, is the technology. The risk is not the market. We're not, this is not, you know, if, if, I, if we were, if we'd come up, you know, unfortunately we didn't, but if we'd come up with Facebook, you had a, t a, a technical risk to a degree, 
but then a market risk as well. Like, you know, why would anybody want to do that? Turns out everybody did. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but for us, we're making fuel. And so there is no market risk. The, the, it was about saying, is this possible? And if the economics of this pan out in the way we want them to, we hope they will, then, then this will be a no-brainer. And it will be about us forging partnerships with, with groups that are, are seeking to minim, uh, industrial groups with the feedstock that's min, seeking to minimize their carbon and environmental uh, footprint um, and going from there. So they're looking to buy uh, a jet fuel product that, we're, that we can make. And, um, uh, and, and you know, we only really sort of decided to get into that because we all wanted to meet Richard Branson, so. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Hello. Yeah, just in terms of fuels, so aviation fuels I've just heard, like, so fuels like a direct substitution for vehicle, vehicle gas in the States, like, yeah. so, oh, okay, so you, but are, you a are blending change component. the world, I get it, so. So, so you can, so we make, we make a fuel, uh, it's called ethanol, it's the same as the, the, the ethanol that they make today in the US from corn, uh, but we make it from, from it, uh, um, residues from industry. And, and that fuel displaces gasoline. So opposed to corn ethanol, you're just going to have... So you don't lose gas food, gas you lock down carbon from industry. Mm-hmm. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah? You mentioned you had a clear patch strategy. Um, when did that come to play? Or when did you initiate that right at the beginning when you were planning or starting out your technology? No, we... Uh, so again, you know, this is this is great advice from investors. So, Vinod, Vinod sort of gave three pieces of advice, and I've spoken about this before, where he basically said, patent aggressively, hire the best team, and get steel in the ground. And and part of I think, Kozla Ventures' motivation for investing in us was that we represented an IP play that was quite quite novel. Uh, we were proposing using very different resources for the production of a fuel that at that time that, that everybody was interested in. Uh, and, and so we represented a quite unique uh, patent opportunity. Mm. So I, 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 I guess that's when it comes to something as quite, quite as unique as what you guys have, have put together. So painting is, as I understand, a really painful process to go through. No, no, it's, no? it's very, just very expensive. Painful. <laughs> <laughs> My books are equals painful. Um, and is that something that investors um, themselves... Is that something that investors um, have ever had issue with? initially of the expense of painting of like, like you said actually um, mm. that they're always looking to what they're going to be investing in in the future rather than what's happening right now no in fact I mean it's, it becomes the reason to invest I mean think about what, what is a patent really you know and to, to your investor a patent is insurance mm. so you get you get hit by a bus or your team gets hit by a bus they'll get written off because you take the company outing and the bus caught on fire be dead what's the investor got the investors got IP. The investors got uh, the as, as, is is sure that you've been able to capture uh, the uh, the essence of, of of your technology and block others from from accessing that space. Do you ever feel that you've um, lost some of your own IP to investors? Has it been hard to let go? No, no, not at all. I mean. And again, this, so that sort of comes back to dilution. Yeah, so you, you take on investment, you get diluted. Um, for me, personally, personally, I, I take the view that our company is, is either going to be something massive or nothing. Yeah? So it's, you, know, you, you, you don't start a fuel, a company that can produce, has the potential to produce fuel with the idea that uh, you know, it's going to have a small valuation at some point and just get kind of uh, bought out. It's going to get, it's either going to have a massive valuation, have a huge impact and, and, be, and be extremely valuable or have no value whatsoever. There's no middle ground there. Mm. And so if, if you're confident in the latter, then, then you don't mind taking a dilution hit upon investment because 
um, your your five percent uh, is going to be worth a shit ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! How awful! Yeah. Anybody else in the room before I hit my next question? Oh my god, hands already! This is lovely. Go, shoot. Uh, question about getting people on board. How did you convince people to join your team or convince your partner where you didn't have a market when you first started? How, the, how, how did you convince them to join like, ah, oh, this is a really... People to join the team as employees or um, the to work on the Employees, yeah. Yeah. Well, probably yeah. partners. Yeah, I mean, our partners we convinced with... Um, by telling them about our, our technology and, and effectively with data and... Uh, uh, and an IP and so on and so forth. Uh, with with employees, um, we've, we've you know I, th I think we've marketed ourselves pretty well as a, as, as a company. Um, Are you pretty attractive to um, to people? Do you have um, a lot of people saying I would like to apply for this job at the Answer Tech? We do. We, I mean, now it's turned around. You know, now it's quite quite cool because we have people approaching us. Previously, we used to shoulder tap and mm -hmm. and try and draw people in, and and target specific types to, to yeah. join our company, and uh, and in in those days we really would, and and we'd present an opportunity and say, look, you know, you could be part of something. It could be huge. If you're any good, it will be. <laughs> are, there any, are there any particular um, strategies in place to to keep your your employees? Engaged, excited. You know, is it like working for for Pixar, where you get to take home your very own Nemo? Um, no one has a fish uh, given to them, but um, <laughs> but we do. Uh, everybody gets share options. Uh, who works for the company? Um, you know, we we try and keep a very excited kind of atmosphere at work. We we focus You're on company dealing company. with flammable materials. Every day is really exciting. Toxic and flammable. Oh my Not god! I want flammable. to come and join you. <laughs> Give me some latex gloves <laughs> and some goggles. I'm there. But back to um, convincing the partners. Now, you know, I keep coming back to this, but you've you've obviously got something about you. You excite me. You excite a lot of people in the room. How? Have you convinced people to get on board a company that was literally just a couple of lines on a piece of paper and, like you say, some equations? Was it because the idea at the time, around about the time it was fashionable, sustainability was just really starting to become something that people were understanding? The carbon footprint idea yeah. was becoming very popular around the, in the early 2000s. Yeah, I mean, I think we were lucky with timing, certainly. I mean, there was lots of investment into clean tech at that time. Mm. Uh, uh, Coastal Ventures at that time were, were um, strongly focused on investing in clean tech uh, mm. at that time, particularly clean tech focused on fuel and chemical synthesis. Um, so we were very, very lucky with timing. Um, that's true. The other uh, piece is that I think we had something that was a little bit different to everybody else, and that was... Uh, that again was uh, tremendously fortunate, um, and then you know it, it's it it was then locally it was really um, it was just it was really a, again about sort of targeting the people who we wanted money from. We wanted to raise money from from Coastal Ventures. They were our target. It wasn't that we pitched uh, eight people and whoever came up was was gonna was gonna work. We Smart actually money. wanted. We actually wanted uh, Vinod to, to, to invest, and, and that was our target mm. at that time. Smart money. I saw a hand over here. Obviously, not that she knows something already. But no. behind? Um, I just wanted to know if you could give us some insight into how you went about getting the government research funds. Yeah, I mean, that again, that was a, a long slog. It, uh, it was really about building relationships within, uh, within government and sort of educating them as to what we were doing. Having credible investors on board and showing an ability to match their dollars and, uh, and to say, look, people who, there's, there's really big investors who've got skin in the game uh, uh, and they'd really appreciate if you'd come and help uh, was, was a big part of it. Um, and then putting together a, a research plan and delivering on it. So it, it wasn't like, we got a very big grant of $12 million at, uh, at one point. But it wasn't, that wasn't the first time we got government money. Previously, we'd got small amounts of government money. And with every grant we got, we delivered. 
and we uh, and sometimes we you know oftentimes we over delivered over delivered and so we built up a good rec track record with government and then when it came to the the very big grant that we won we were again able to over deliver in terms of matching funds uh, in terms of uh, ip secured per uh, uh, um, money invested and so for us we feel very comfortable that that we gave back exactly what we said we were going to do and a lot more. Has those um, relationships with government helped you in the US and China? They have, um, but they're very different relationships. You know, in the US and China, the great thing about starting a company in New Zealand, frankly, is that this is a very small com country. And so in order for me to get a meeting in China and, and the assistance in China of the US ambassador as a US company, I'd have to be the guy that started Boeing, yeah? Hmm. I'd have to be Mr. Exxon. But coming from New Zealand, I've had really great assistance and, 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 and meetings with our ambassador in China because you know, we're a country of four and a half million people and, uh, and, and the government get on board and back people who, who, who make an effort and, and go out there and do something interesting. It's quite exciting being um, an entrepreneur, a startup, um, having a great idea in a country of this size because it doesn't take much to be able to speak to the people who can actually make a difference. There is that two degree of separation. Yeah. And it doesn't take a month of Sundays to cut through everybody mm. and sit down with the person who's going to really make a difference to your business. Yeah. God, I'm excited this evening. Um, anybody else in the room? Hello. Um, just want to know something technical. Um, in terms of why did you choose to use waste as a substrate for bacteria? Do you think if you didn't choose waste, you would possibly have more output in terms of how much fuel you get? No, I mean, we, we, we targeted resource, I mean, we targeted resources that we knew to be available at, at, at very, in very high volumes. So this is, so think about it. So globally, how much, how much uh, fuel could you produce from, um, from the waste gases coming from, from the steel industry? And, and the number is in excess of 30 billion gallons a year. Yeah, so, so these wastes are available globally. Locally, they're, they're available in abundance. And uh, and they have the they they have the, the the potential to produce truly impactful volumes of fuel. And so this is not this is not about setting up little uh, mom and pop uh, uh, operations in 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 small places. This is about producing things at a, a sort of global refinery scale uh, uh, or in global refinery scale volumes. Is it a technology that you could put into place in? Um, third world countries? Is it a technology that can be taken anywhere and recreated to produce this renewable energy source easily? Yes. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and was, was that something that you felt when you, you got comfortable with your strategy and you had everything in place that it was quite high on your list of priorities to be able to do this? Like you say, on a global scale, so we're talking about billions and billions of gallons of barrels of, of, of energy, but I think refinery, I think of a very complex um, enterprise, I think of a very complex process. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, I mean, technically this, this is not so complex. It's, I mean, for, for, from my perspective, I don't think it's so complex, but I think that, but you know, okay, so what I think is behind your question is, is so what's the motivation? Is the motivation to- Saving the world or is it making money? Yeah, and, and it's neither. It's, it's actually to, so few scientists get to see what they do mean something, yeah? yeah? Become something, look, you know, like, and I mean, the biggest thrill for me in Lanzatech is actually knowing that at first, I had the process operating a test tube in my hand and I put a bit of gas in the top, put a stopper on it, shook it about for a, a, a day or two, and then in the bit, bit of, um, liquid at the bottom, but about the same concentration of the gin I have in there, I've got a bit of ethanol that I've made from gas with a, with, with a, a, a bacteria. That's cool, that was really exciting when that first happened. And now I get to look at something that stands 20 meters above the ground, is attached to a steel mill in China and makes sort of barrels of fuel a day. Now, 
for me, that's the privilege, that's the excitement, because <laughs> as a scientist, that's the wet dream, yeah? You, you don't get to, to see your science turn into something that actually happens. We're having, like, science teenage dreams going on over here. That's great. It's great. <laughs> we should have all been wearing gloves and goggles at one point. Um, anybody else in the room? Yeah, yeah. I've got a question. Um, it's, I suppose it's a, a question that might lead into another one. So it sounds like you can actually make the sort of ethanol from landfill. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so practically I'm just thinking that through. How do you do that? Like. I imagine a landfill this big pile of waste. Mm. So do you, do you put some sort of cover over the spit no, thing, or do you no, no, shovel no. so, into some sort of device? But yeah, so think, how does it work? So think about think about um, think about this 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 material as as a bunch of waste hydrocarbons. So what is landfill? It's, it's, it's plastics, it's organic matter, it's rubbers, all this kind of stuff, all mixed together. And so what happens in many countries around the world, such as Japan, is they take that, uh, that resource, and they don't put it in the ground, because they're much more sensible than the rest of us, uh, and they gasify it. What does that mean? It means they heat it up, and they take that hydrocarbon, and they turn it into hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So a gas. So they're burning the waste. But it's not, well, it's not burning in the sense that you set it on fire as a flame and you produce CO2. Okay. They, they effectively... Uh, combust it in the absence of oxygen, which means they produce an energy, con they, they change the form of the matter from solid to an energy containing gas with a process. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and it's that gas that we can take and turn into fuels and chemicals. Okay, with just our to play devil's advocate, what happens to everything that doesn't turn into gas? It's, I mean, it, that represents uh, about 1% of, of, of the material, so it's your ash. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, so, and that is then uh, right down to a very small amount, and that can be used variously as uh, either kind of stuff on the road or. We're we talking whatever. about completely recyclable landfill. Uh, see, I don't even think about it as recyclable. I think uh, you know. I, I think the waste is a kind of dated idea. You know, it's it's kind of you know, it's 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 the stupid stuff that we used to do, or it needs to become the stupid stuff that we used <laughs> to do, and. Uh, and so you've got to, you've got to think of, of, of this as kind of an industrial ecology where, where the output of one thing becomes the input of another. And I hope that doesn't sound terribly idealistic, but it's, but it's, it's, it's really saying we don't accept that there's a waste. We don't accept that, uh, that there's such a thing as, as pollution. We only accept uh, that the output of this is, can be useful for something. We don't mm. accept simply having terminal carbon all the time. Well, I'm subscribing to your church. Does that answer the second <laughs> part of your question? It, it does. Um, I, I think the only other comment I've got is I understand um, that down in Christchurch, uh, the city council have a, a landfill that does eat some form of energy from the landfill. They do, and, and so that's methane. And so, methane. And so is this a different process or is this the same completely process? Completely different process. process. Completely different process. So what, 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 what they're doing and what many landfills do is uh, is accept that they're going to put a lot of stuff in the ground and that stuff is going to go in two directions, yeah? It's going to decompose into uh, a liquid that then ends up being a leachate, which is, uh, which is <laughs> not good for anyone, uh, and a gas, methane, the product of anaerobic digestion, which then goes into the atmosphere. Methane gas is about 21-something times more powerful than CO2 as a, as a greenhouse agent. So very, very toxic. So uh, often people just flare that, uh, that methane, but the more sensible people like the folk in Christchurch will convert that into a form of energy. Are they one of your competitors? No. No? Working Not alongside? Just it's, casually just shaking hands? It's just different. Right. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a different way of, 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 of capturing uh, some benefit from that, that resource. Mm. Okay. Anybody else in the room? Andre? Yeah, I've got a question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not used to hearing you talk. You just give me alcohol, and I love it for it. No, because uh, quite an interesting one. If, um, if you guys are actually doing anything to encourage or to drive the use of the ethanol as a fuel, because I I come from Brazil, so you might you might know that in Brazil it's widely used in cars, run ethanol, and most cars 
Um, since 10 years ago, they actually flex so you can choose in a petrol station mm. whether you want to use petrol or ethanol. Mm. So, of course, whether they don't don't get the ethanol through, then they do sugar cane and do the normal process. But um, are you guys doing anything to drive the consumption into into pushing your other industries like in New Zealand? That's not why why they spread the actually use of ethanol. Yeah. No, so. We're not. We're no. We we, we are not marketers of mm. of ethanol as a fuel. Um, what you find, uh, as is is the case in Brazil, that around the world there are mandates. So governments have stipulated that ethanol must be a part of the fuel supply, and and, and we are a supplier of ethanol uh, to meet that demand. And so. We're not here advocating that uh, that everybody needs to put ethanol in their fuel. Personally, I think it's a great thing to do. Um, the but what we find is around the world there are lots of uh, geographies where there is a mandate to include ethanol in the fuel, but there just isn't the domestic supply or production of ethanol, and so they're reliant on importing ethanol from places like Brazil where they produce it commercially at very large scale. Will that be your primary, your primary market to um, supply governments who will invariably distribute, or is it a purely a private sector thing? No, it's, I mean, even, even, even in places like Brazil or in the US, it's the government sets the mandate, the fuel companies have to deliver on it. Yeah. So you're, you're selling to fuel companies at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, but, and, but for Landsatec, that's, that's one string to our bow. Yeah? Making ethanol is, is probably the thing we'll start off with, but making chemicals is also where we, we're interested in going. Mm. So last question from me then, if there's nobody else in the room. What would be your core piece of advice? Core piece of advice to the entrepreneurial scientist in the room right now, the person who wants to change the world. What's the one piece of things? What's the one piece of advice these guys can take home with them, and me, mainly me? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I mean, if you're going to start something, then just start it. I mean, just think about the the the. the I mean, our attitude always was that the, that we really didn't have anything to lose, getting something going. So that would be that. The first thing. The second thing would be. Think about how much money you think you need and then try and carve out a piece of time where you imagine a world where you had 10 times that amount of money. And, and what would that mean in terms of your timelines, in terms of your prospects, in terms of the development of your process? Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a very, very enjoyable and enlightening evening for me. I hope it has been for you as well. 